Hey, it's Alicia from mobilitymastery.com. And a few years ago, I put out a video called the best foods for your fascia and something about three, the three best foods for your fascia. And it's getting quite a bit of traffic these days. And we'll, we'll link to that in case it's interesting to you. Um, and back then I was more looking at what is causing fascia to become the most restricted and how can we, you know, be proactive about making sure our fascia is the healthiest as possible without getting super critical about the way we're living our lives. And so in that video, spoiler alert, uh, I talked about how food is the lowest on my list for how to think about having healthy fascia. And instead I talked about stress being the number one thing that caused unhealthy fascia. And I still maintain that that's true. And I would define stress as, you know, it could be relationship stress, life stress, money stress, but it's some form of kind of like chronic fight, flight, freeze response, uh, where you're not able to process your life fully. So I actually think it's possible to be highly stressed out, but orient to stress as a positive thing or that you know, you're, you're activated because you have a lot going on and you're excited about what's happening in your life. And when your fascia is healthy, you can actually move a lot of stress through your body and not take it on. Uh, so getting healthy fascia in the first place, like creating um, a healthy fascial system and optimization and then maintaining that optimization will help high stress, you know, achieve high achieving, high stress entrepreneurs and the like to uh, run more stress th through their system without actually taking it on. But in the last few years, I've really looked at also all the other factors that contribute to unhealthy fascia. And a huge one is toxicity. And this is like a topic in and of itself, toxicity is, that we could dive way into, but it shows up a lot in our food and our food system. So a little known fact about me that you may not be aware of is that my first passion was actually food and nutrition. Uh, when I was 17, I started reading all kinds of uh, diet and, and not diet, like how to lose weight, but I mean like healthy food, like books by Dr. Um, Mark Hyman in my 20s, uh, Diet for a New America. I became vegetarian and then vegan for moral reasons back then. Ate way too much soy because we didn't know how bad it was. Really messed up my gut, um, but was absolutely fascinated with how food can impact the quality of our lives. And I actually became a holistic health coach and a member of the National Association of Drugless Practitioners in America. And that's not really something I, I claim that much these days. It's not something I do. I don't do health coaching, but I just want you to know that I do have a, a background in it and a passion for it. So I'm bringing in some information today about healthy foods to include and what to avoid for healthy fascia. And what I wanna talk about first is how um, like why these things are important. And I also want to give you a framework for my orientation to, to diet or food choices. So I'm not a vegetarian or vegan anymore. I, that didn't really work for my body type. I don't know if it's because of my genetics. I am Italian. I don't know if it's because of something else or just like my body type, but I tend to need meat and, and healthy fats from things like grass fed meats. And that's my choice. I don't judge or disrespect anybody who makes different choices like being vegetarian or vegan. I think we all need to make these choices for ourselves. And I believe that within any choice of how to eat and what to eat, you can be healthy and make healthy choices. So I'm really covering like the basics and a lot of you are probably already aware of this, but what I wanna emphasize uh, today is how, they think, how these things might impact your fascia. So toxicity, is really at the root of this conversation because I've learned in the last few years, I wasn't aware of this when I put out that other video, um, but I've learned in the last few years how connected the lymph system is to the fascial system. So the lymph system lives inside the superficial fascia. Um, superficial fascia just means closest to the skin. So our lymph system is close to the skin. It's, you know, right under there. 
uh, things that can definitely impact that lymph and superficial fascia, it's not just food. It might be things like creams or lotions that you put on your body, um, things in the air, the water that you shower under, etc. But our focus today is going to be on food because what we eat has a profound impact on our entire body. So if you're eating foods that contain a lot of toxins or chemicals, then that is definitely going to, um, or I should say potentially going to impact your fascia. I don't want to say definitely. I'm a firm believer that we're all on kind of unique journeys. Some people, for whatever reason, can process a lot of toxicity and appear pretty healthy. Uh, so I've got an avoid list here and an include list. And um, I just want to say again up front that like so much goes into health, right? So one of the things I've talked a lot about the last few years here on Mobility Mastery is the connection between our gut and like the gut brain connection. But also beyond that to me, it's like the, the gut being uh, like an epicenter of consciousness for us, how it's, it's one of the main areas of our body where we process incoming information from the outside, from, you know, whether it's food or the environment and environmental toxicity, uh, as well as like listening to our gut. Uh, you know, it's, some people call it the second brain. Some people call it the first brain. I believe our connection to our gut is critical for living fulfilled lives for living in integrity with ourselves and something else that I've talked about a lot here on Mobility Mastery is that when we are listening to our guts, when we are listening to our intuition, and when we choose to make decisions for our lives that put us in alignment with our values and who we are, uh, our fascia tends to get healthier. So that's a really fascinating part of, of the fascial system to me. Uh, it's something that remains a little mysterious uh, and something I'm in awe of. And I'm really curious about this connection between food and what we put in our gut and our ability to actually listen to the gut. So that first video I put out, you know, I still maintain like chronic bad stress or your orientation to it being like maybe it's bad uh, is definitely going to wind up your fascia the most and cause it to be the most restricted on a system wide level. But what you eat is going to have the potential to have a profound effect on that superficial uh, fascia and your lymph system. And so if you have toxic build up in your lymph system and your superficial fascia, you may not even be able to get the benefits of effective fascia release for pain, for example, because your superficial fascia may actually be so inflamed and so tender and sore that you can't even get into those deeper layers. So this is a complex subject because, you know, talking about the gut and how we digest food and then how we process toxins, right? There's the liver, there's the kidneys, there's the skin, there's um, the lymph system, right? And all of these things help us to detox. So I'm not going to go deep on detoxing and toxicity in terms of all those other systems of the body. But for sure, if you are backed up, clogged in your lymph and superficial fascia system, um, fascia release is going to feel really tender, really painful to, to the touch in like a really sore, tender way. Um, fascia release at the deeper level, so inside the muscle belly, is going to feel more intense in nature, more like, ooh, whoa. Whereas the superficial fascia, when it's super toxic, uh, tends to feel like, oh, like that's so tender, right? Like, I just can't even like put any weight on it. So you can't even get to that intensity that you have within the superficial or within the deeper fascia, right? So um, one clue that you could use to determine if you need to maybe look at your diet or your environment for toxicity would be if your superficial fascia is really tender like that. So when you get on a foam roller or a lacrosse ball or any other tool and it just feels impossible to even put a little bit of weight on it, um, I would look at your diet, your environment, your home, um, and try to figure out what's causing a toxic buildup. 
So today we're gonna dive into my general guidelines for what to eat for healthy fascia. It's some things you really wanna avoid because of the toxic factor and then what to include from a pretty general broad perspective. And like I said, I'm not trying to tell you you should eat meat or shouldn't eat meat uh, or anything like that. I think it's an individual choice, um, but definitely things to avoid are anything chemical or toxic in nature. So that means pesticides, hormones, um, glyphosate uh, is just a huge, massive problem in the world. I'm not gonna dive into talking about it, but I encourage you to look up anything by Dr. Zach Bush on this topic, especially his podcasts uh, with Rich Roll. They're amazing. Really, really, really insightful, important information to know. Uh, you don't want to eat a whole lot of processed foods. Now, I'm someone who every once in a while, like, I want a pizza or I want, you know, some French fries every once in a while. <laughs> so to me, it's not about strict disciplinarian religious food views where I never, ever, ever eat a single processed food in my life. I definitely do sometimes. I also keep activated charcoal in my medicine cabinet and I'll take that sometimes if I've eaten processed foods. So it is to me a bit about balance, but what I mostly mean about avoiding processed foods would be things like a lot of what's in standard supermarkets and the standard American diet uh, when it comes to chips and flavored foods or prepared foods that have all kinds of chemicals in them. So we're talking about those long ingredient lists where you can't even pronounce the names of the ingredients in what you're eating. That would probably indicate it's a, a Franken food. It was made in a lab. It's not really food anymore. Um, so even, you, you know, I buy some processed foods, but I'm looking for ingredients lists that are like five ingredients long, or you know maybe 10 if it's something like a pizza, but they're all ingredients that I know. I can pronounce them. They may even be organic, hopefully. Uh, so again, I'm not super strict here, but mostly what we're trying to avoid are those chemicals and toxins. You don't really wanna be putting that in your body because that's gonna put a lot of strain on those uh, detox systems as well as your gut, which might make it harder to listen to your gut and have a cascading effect to the rest of your life. Um, bad fats and oils are a huge one. They can be extremely toxic. Uh, canola oil has been genetically modified since I guess like the 1990s uh, to resist glyphosate and most of the canola fields are sprayed very liberally with glyphosate. It's not really even a, a food anymore. So when we think about you know, traditional good oils, like olive oil, it's coming from an olive. That's the only ingredient. They press it, the oil comes out, they put it in a bottle and you eat it. That is not the same with canola oil. There's no such thing as a canola plant. It's called rapeseed. And anyway, you can go look this up on your own if you are a super nerd and you wanna actually get the science and the data uh, behind this, but I avoid canola oil as much as I can. I never feel good if I eat it accidentally. And along with that, you wanna avoid hydrogenated oils and soy um, and really any other highly processed oils. Uh, I'm gonna get over to our include list and what to eat because I the way that I orient to food primarily is I don't want to spend a lot of time thinking about what to avoid. It's a lot easier to actually just think about what I include. That way, anything that's not on the included list, I don't consider eating. Um, so I would encourage you to adopt that attitude as well. It's a whole lot easier than thinking you have to memorize the list of chemicals and pesticides and hormones and things you, you're supposed to avoid um, when you know the healthy options to include and you look for those, it just becomes a lot easier. Um, but finally, I would also tend to avoid unhealthy sugars like refined white processed sugar, um, agave and high fructose corn syrup. Yes, agave. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of research uh, being done that shows that it's actually almost as bad as high fructose corn syrup. They are processed in a very similar way. And most of you probably know how bad high fructose corn syrup is. I'm not gonna give you a history on that, but high fructose corn syrup is found in sodas and ketchup and all kinds of 
processed foods that you're going to find in normal, you know, American or modern supermarkets. Uh, so typically if you're shopping at like a co-op or a natural food store, uh, or whole foods or anything like that. Um, although I wouldn't necessarily count on whole foods anymore. <laughs> um, but, uh, the, the smaller it is and the more dedicated to being natural and organic, the more likely it is all their products won't even have these things, but you still want to look for it. So with that said, let's look at what to include. So this is very much how I eat on a regular basis. And, um, and of course there are, you know, things I didn't include here cause I'm not trying to be super, um, s detailed about exactly which vegetables to eat and which not to eat, for example. So these again are just some guidelines. Um, so you want to eat a lot of healthy fats. We actually need fat. The, the brain needs fat to function. Um, so does the body. The best fats are going to be coconut oil, grass fed butter or ghee, olive oil, and things like avocados or avocado oil. Um, I don't use a lot of vegetable oils. So things like sunflower oil or, um, safflower oil and stuff like that. I have them and I use them very sparingly, um, for really high heat cooking if I do that. And it's not that often that I do frying or like really high heat cooking. Um, so most of the time I'm using grass fed butter, olive oil and coconut oil, and I love avocados. So I will eat avocados, um, vegetables. This is going to be personal, right? But the more colorful and varied, the better, uh, some of my favorite ways to eat veggies is just to be seasonal with it. So right now I live in Durango, Colorado. It's winter as I'm filming this and it, you know, it's hard to get a lot of like summer vegetables or fruits. Um, and I didn't really include fruits here. So I'd say I should have put veggies and fruits. Um, but I'll go to uh, a market that's a couple miles away. It's a, uh, a market that's on the property of a local farm where they grow the meat that I eat and they have curated whatever the local farmers in Colorado can grow right now, either in a greenhouse or in the winter. And I'll pretty much figure out how to eat based on what I can find. <laughs> so if there, there's not a farmer's market right now, because we're in winter, when there's a farmer's market, same thing, I'll either go to that market or the farmer's market. And I will look at what's available buy what inspires me that looks good, bring it home and then figure out, okay, what do I do with this? Like, I guess I'm eating, you know, a lot of beets right now, <laughs> or I guess I'm eating, you know, some salads and some root vegetables and some meat and some good fat. Uh, so that's how I like to do that. And again, it might depend on like what part of the world you live in, what's seasonally available, uh, and then what your preferences are. But I would also include good fruits. I don't eat a ton of fruit. Um, I don't eat a ton of sugar. I do have a little bit of a sweet tooth sometimes and I'll want a little bit of a treat, but for me, it's something, um, like a coconut oil, chocolate truffle. I love them. Um, and I'll, I just need like one and then I'm done. Um, and I don't typically eat a lot of like processed sugars or a lot of fruits. I'll have, sometimes I'll include like, uh, dried sour cherries without any sugar, um, added to them or dried cranberries without sugar added or an unripe pear to a salad with walnuts and homemade salad dressing and stuff like that. Um, that's kind of how I get a little bit of sweet into my diet. Um, and then if you're a meat eater, I do feel like it's really important to primarily eat healthy, humane, humanely raised meats that are hopefully grass fed and pastured. This feels really important to me at this point in my life. I've wavered in and out of, of eating. Like sometimes I just want some Thai food and it's rare that they have good meats and I'll eat it and then I'll feel like crap. I just, my body's kind of like getting more and more insistent that I eat, uh, only pasture raised, humanely raised meat. So I'm really lucky that we live very close to this farm where we can get uh, pastured local 100% grass uh, grazed meats um, and they're a wonderful family farm. So I love that. And that's pretty much the meat that I get these days when I go out to eat. If they don't have something local and grass fed, 
I, I eat vegetarian for the most part. Uh, I also love making like Caesar dressing with anchovies or putting anchovies on a homemade pizza or in pasta or something like that to get some good um, fats and omegas from things like anchovies and sardines. I don't actually eat a lot of sardines, but I hear they're really good for you. Um, I don't eat a lot of fish personally. Um, and then just typical guidelines for all of this. Look for words like heirloom, organic, pastured, local, biodynamic. Of course, not all local produce or meat is going to be free of antibiotics or hormones or pesticides. So that would be something you want to talk to people about. But to be perfectly honest, I've lost my faith in the organic standards in America. So I would rather actually talk to a local farmer who might, might tell me, you know, we are organic, we're just not certified because the, the standards are, you know, like in order to get certified, it's kind of a whole hoopla. And so they might call it no spray, um, but you can get to know your local farmers and actually talk to them and it might not be certified organic, but it might, it might even be better than organic because a lot of the time what's happening right now is uh, if you've ever driven through the middle of California, for example, you're going to see fields and fields and fields of produce, some of which is organic. And then right next to the non-organic is the organic farm, but the pesticides and they're, they're like dry, you know, like flying over this area of the world in plain spraying pesticides. I mean, how can they make sure that they only spray the uh, non-organic? Um, I just, I feel like, you know, the wind blows things and even, you know, a lot of the organic berry companies, for example, are just growing berries in mass. Like, I don't know. I, I like to buy things that are either wild, um, wild caught, wild grown, or, you know, like foraged myself. There are actually wild raspberries here in Colorado that I found hiking and I'll just like gorge myself. Um, they taste so much better. So things grown in actual soil, like really healthy soil, are going to taste better and be better for you. So something to just kind of think about here um, that I didn't include uh, is adding good minerals through real salt. So I should have put that on the list, but you want to avoid table salt, like the, the typical white table salt that you get in most grocery stores. And you want to buy something like real salt or Celtic sea salt or pink Himalayan sea salt. Uh, any of those would be good options. Uh, and then herbs. So that's where you're going to get the minerals that are uh, really important for diet. And then I want to kind of bring this back to fascia here at the end. So why are some of these things good for your fascia? Well, I mean, I think you know why these are not good. <laughs> so I'm going to focus on why these things are good. We need collagen to rebuild and repair tendons and ligaments and muscle. And where do we get collagen? Typically from, from animal um, products like grass-fed butter or ghee. Uh, I could have put on here homemade bone broths. So I'm a huge fan of making bone broths at home. Uh, here's a tip. If you didn't know this already, make sure you put apple cider vinegar or some kind of vinegar, but apple cider vinegar is my favorite in the stock when you're making it. Because if you don't do that, it, it, there's no acid in there that will pull out the collagen and the minerals from the bones. So you don't actually get the benefit of the collagen that's in, you know, whether it's chicken bones or beef bones. So you got to put some kind of acid like apple cider vinegar into your broth as you're making it to pull out the nutrients that are going to feed your fascia. Um, so we need things like that to actually rebuild and repair tendons and ligaments and muscle tissue and bones. So eating well actually is important to our fascia, even if you're not you know, inflamed superficially because what we eat creates the building blocks of what's in our blood and what's in our blood is what nourishes our fascia. And you want to open your fascia to get the blood through and into, you know, the cells where it's needed and into, um, from that extracellular environment into the intracellular environment. And so, so whatever you eat becomes what's in your blood and what's in your blood is what you have to nourish your body with and repair at the cellular level. So if you're eating crap, you're going to have crap blood and make crap tendons. <laughs> um, and that's super scientific, right? So it's, there's a lot 
to it. And again, some people can get away with it for whatever reason, uh, eating crap and they stay relatively healthy. So my personal philosophy is that this is a personal choice. It's, you know, you know, unique to us. My best advice really is to listen to your body and honor what your body needs. And I also believe that what we need changes seasonally. It changes throughout our life. So there's the season of a given month or a given year or a given day. Um, and then the seasons we go through in life. And when we're in different seasons of our lives, we probably need to eat a little differently. And it also is going to depend on how active we are and you know what our lifestyle choices are that ultimately makes up how healthy our fash is. So it's a really holistic thing from the big picture and your food choices are just one piece of the puzzle. So I hope this felt useful, hopefully more useful than the other video where I think people are feeling a little trolled. Um, so I didn't mean to do that back then. Uh, we will link to that video in case you want to watch it. I talk a little bit more about how stress affects fascia. So if that's interesting to you and you want to combine that knowledge with what you learned today about how food impacts your fascia, uh, we will put that in the description link below. And if you haven't gotten it yet, I encourage you to get my beginner's guide to fascia release. Uh, you know, if you're new to fascia and fascia release, I encourage you to learn the basics and master them. So you're not just kind of shooting uh, darts at your problems, you're really tackling them with efficiency and knowledge and skill. Um, so we'll also link that uh, link to that below in the description box, but um, share any of your takeaways or thoughts on the topic of food and what to eat below. Let me know if you have felt a difference in changing your diet and how your fascia feels. I would love to, to know what that's like because I, the only way I really learn about all of this is through my own body and experimentation and then by talking to you or my clients but people in my community. So your input is valuable here. So I'd love to hear from you by commenting below uh, and thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.